So next, our healthcare, wellness, and society folks prepare to dive into Holo Medicine, the next generation integrated medical platform. Dr. Yu Jia Gao from the National University Health System is here to nav navigate us through. Let's welcome Dr. Gao. <laughs> hi, hi, good afternoon everyone. I'm glad to see everyone here. So um, I'm from the National University Health System here in Singapore and today I'm going to touch a little bit about how we are using XR technology and um, its, its infrastructure to enhance the way that we treat patients. Right? And essentially to address what we would consider the future of an integrated medical platform. So a little bit about, about myself, I'm a consultant in liver transplant surgery and I'm also the assistant group CTO for our university health system and that's where I get to play around a lot with new technology, gadgets and also to learn some of the pains of our development team uh, working on the different projects. Right, so a few declarations that I have before I start the presentation. Um, do be advised that I will be showing photos and videos from the operating theatre. So there will be some blood, not too much, um, not too much gore as well. Um, but essentially, these are real cases that we have been doing in our hospital in the last two, two and a half years of using this technology. Now, AI in healthcare is not something new. It's been around for the last 20, 25 years. But of course, in the last decade, or, or I would say the last two, three years or so, it's gotten a lot more prominent. It's gotten a lot more um, interest as well as press. And in NUH, we are no different. We deploy a wide range of AI, machine learning, and you know, new capabilities, for example, predictive modeling, chatbots, um, patient movement charting, and of course, AR and MR technology, which is what I'm going to talk about more today. So the NUHS Holomedicine program, which is what we call our XR program, started about two and a half years ago in January 2021. And the whole aim, um, or the whole reason why we decided to embark on this entire journey was to try and leverage on mixed reality and XR technology to bring about real patient benefits and to enhance the way that we treat our patients. Right? So the aim at that point in time and our focus was not really on training and education, but to use it in real life scenarios, in the wards, in the operating theatres, and really to see how we can use a technology like this to improve the way we treat our patients and to improve our patient outcomes. And to make sure, or to try to make sure that this is not a temporary program, this is not a fling, this is not a short term, you know, see how it goes and after that we don't do anything about it. We wanted to make sure that this program is sustainable. We wanted to make sure that we built our infrastructure and our, our criteria, curriculums around it to make sure that we can maintain this program. Right, so this is the way we approached it, where we look at different areas to make sure that we remain relevant and this program survives. Um, clinical use cases, how we use it on the ground is definitely the most important, right? because if we don't identify the correct use cases, then the technology is not going to work. Right? Scientific research and development, this is important as well. Without the data science team, without the computer engineers, the program's not going to survive. Educational use case development comes naturally with all the things that we're planning to do. But one of the things that we also realized along the way is that we, it is not possible for us to only focus on the front-end use cases and the front-end applications without addressing the back-end infrastructure that's necessary for us to support everything that we do in front. So here comes the pictures and some videos. The most obvious inroad or the most obvious use case for us as a start was to use it for surgeries. Right? Because in surgery, we rely a lot on imaging, CT scans, MRIs, and we use this imaging to plan for our surgeries. What MR allowed us to do was to convert these scans from a 2D CT scan, three, uh, MRI scans, PET scan, into a three-dimensional hologram. And now for the first time, the surgeons, including myself, we could actually plan our surgeries in 3D and not just on a computer screen. And one of the biggest benefits of using MR technology, um, in our hospital, we use the HoloLens 2 from Microsoft. 
was that we could bring these headsets into the operating theatre with us, and it allows us to actually superimpose the images onto the patient on the operating table, and that gives us essentially X-ray vision to see into the patient and to know exactly where the tumours are, exactly where to target, so we do not go off track during the surgery itself. So this is kind of what it looks like through the device itself. So this is me in the office, as you can see, Microsoft HoloLens 2, fully gesture control. We are able to use our segmentation software to identify specific structures within the patient's scan. This is of a liver. Right? We can identify the various types of blood vessels in the liver. We can look at the different segments of the liver. We can even plan and decide how am I going to cut through the liver during the surgery itself. And because now it's in 3D, I can walk into the liver itself and know exactly what structures I'm going to encounter during the surgery. So, so this is essentially doing the surgery even before stepping into the OR itself. And now it's all in 3D and not just on a computer screen. This is one of the use cases where we started using this for pediatrics liver transplant. How we use this is to look at whether the size or the liver from the donor is actually going to fit inside the child. Right? So this particular case you see here, this is a child who is nine months old who needs a liver transplant. Right? This yellow thing that you see, this is the intended portion of the patient's mum that we will use to donate to the child. Right? Before technology like this, we could only estimate whether or not the liver is going to fit based on the weight of the, of the, of the donor's liver. Right, we, we weren't able to predict whether or not it's actually going to fit. But with technology like this, where you can superimpose and overlay the donor's organ into the recipient's body in three dimension, it tells you exactly whether or not this organ is going to fit, or am I going to have to reduce it? Am I going to have to change the shape, change the size? And all this is done before the day of the operation itself. Now, bringing that capability of planning in 3D before the surgery into the operating theatre was the next step that we wanted to make. Right? Because we didn't want this to remain just as a planning software, we wanted to make sure that we can use it during the surgery itself, because if we only use it for planning, then essentially it's just a very nice visualiser. There's no value add to that. Right? So over the last two and a half years, we've used um, MR technology to plan as of now, about 110 surgeries so far. And we've used this as of last week uh, on 56 cases in the operating theatre itself, meaning that the surgeons actually wear this device during the surgery. So what do they actually see? This is what they see. This is our very first attempt at using this for what we call surgical image guidance during a surgery. This is in August 2020, right? the very first time that we use this technology. This is for a patient who is going for a brain surgery, having a tumour removed in the middle of the brain. What you're seeing here is a patient's MRI being superimposed on the patient's head on the operating table, and that essentially allows us to locate exactly where the tumour is. We use it a lot for our liver transplant program. So in NUH, it is standard practice now that we do all the planning as well as the segmentations for our liver transplant donors on our MR platform, and this is during the surgery itself. So if you remember, the image that you saw just now that we used for pre-planning, this is the exact patient who went for the surgery. And what you're seeing here, uh, this image of, that's actually the stomach, right? That is a live stream of a, ca of a camera that's inside the patient, streaming it to the hall lens device and giving you a virtual screen. So instead of having a physical screen in front of us, we are able to create virtual screens and that allows the surgeon to place the screens anywhere they want it to be and any size that they want it to be. And all this is in live stream. This case was for our pediatric transplant, and this is actually just done um, two months ago. So again, this is for a child who needed a new liver because of the, the, their condition. And this is the part where we were looking at whether this liver is going to fit inside the child. Now, as you can see, even without the MR device, this liver looks a little bit too big, right? And once we put it in, you can see that there are parts that are sticking out. So by weight, if we went with the traditional way of matching this organ, this organ would have been a match. It should fit inside the child. 
right? But looking at this, it is very obvious that no way it's going to fit. So we did what we call a graph reduction, meaning that looking at where the parts of the liver is going to stick out on the child based on the MR planning, we actually marked out those portions during the surgery itself. And you can see we shaved off the edges of the liver to make sure that we reduce it to a size that's suitable enough to go inside the child. So this is the liver inside the child. Right? And of course, um, our cardiothoracic team, our, our heart surgeons use it to plan and to help them with their surgery as well. This is a patient who is actually undergoing a heart bypass surgery. So if you see those two green lines on top of the rib cage, those are the blood vessels that the surgeons intend to use for the bypass and to replace the patient's own blood vessels which are not working that well. Right, so these are actual use cases. We use it quite routinely in our OTs now. Um, we run an average of one case that's XR or MR assisted um, every week, sometimes two or three cases depending on the needs. And of course, we find that it's actually a lot more useful or it's more useful for the extremely complex cases. And the more complex and challenging the case is, the more useful technology like this is going to be. Remote assistance, remote proctorship, remote training, this is something that's very important and useful as well. So in this video, this is actually a, a recording uh, of a session last year where we linked surgeons from Singapore, Nepal, India, and Japan in a multi sort of regional, multidisciplinary discussion for a patient who is going to undergo surgery. And as you can see here, the floating heads are the avatars of the surgeons from the different countries discussing about the case through the Hollands itself. And because everything is in three dimension, it feels like you're talking to the person right in front of you, right? It is not a Zoom call. It is not an MS Teams call. It is a three-dimensional call using holograms and you're interacting with your counterpart in 3D in real time. Now, after using this technology for about a year or so, um, it became quite apparent to us that we have to move on from just using this as a nice 3D holographic display. There has to be something else. There has to be another layer, another chapter to this entire story because it's not going to end there. So to us, after what, knowing what we know and learning what we learned, we felt that mixed reality is not just a device, but it is a technology enabler. It is a platform that is going to allow us to expand and to allow us to integrate and be the one single point of control for the surgeon on the ground to have access to information anywhere that they want it to be, whenever that they want it to be. It gives us the opportunity to, to bring in information from multiple devices around the hospital, even outside the hospital, concentrate it into a single user interface and make it something that is convenient and sensible and logical for the clinicians to use on the ground. So that's where we decided to go into what we call point of care solutions. Right? Point of care solutions are instances where we bring the systems, solutions, treatments to the patients instead of patients going to, for example, the radiology department. Right? So on the first video, what you're seeing here is that we're using the infrared camera on the Hollands 2 to identify and to show veins on the patient's hand so that doctors and nurses can identify and see the veins easier, especially for patients with very, very fine veins, patients on chemotherapy, transplant patients, even pediatrics patients. Right. This video shows a live stream of a wireless ultrasound probe that is connected directly to the HoloLens and is sending a stream straight to the HoloLens and it's projecting the image inside the patient. And because now using the cameras and sensors on the HoloLens, we can track exactly where the probe is. We can do essentially what the image below is, where you see the green and blue. It's a real-time three-dimensional reconstruction of what the ultrasound probe is scanning. So imagine doing a sweep on the, on the patient's neck, and within one minute, you get a reconstruction of the patient's windpipe, you get a reconstruction of the patient's thyroid, and any tumors in the thyroid. Right. Traditionally, scans like this, patients wait up to two months for an appointment at the ultrasound department. With this technology, we bring it to the patient's bedside. It's done within five minutes during the same consult. Thank you, Casey. <laughs> right. And of course, the last image we are looking at 
computer vision, segmentations of surgical instruments, and we intend to use this for example, artificial implants when it comes to dental and orthopedic use cases. Right, so these are just some additional photos of the trials that we're conducting in the hospital itself. The next step that we got to thinking is how are we gonna leverage digital twins and bring together digital twin technology, virtual twin technology, and XR. Right, so this is where now we have decided to embark on our latest project, which is to create an anatomical and structural digital twin of organs within the patient's body. And our first venture into this will be the liver, partly biased because I'm a liver surgeon, so it's easier for me to get data and access to my patients. Right, so what we're gonna do, or what we plan to do, is to create an anatomical and functional virtual twin of the patient's liver using biomechanical properties extracted from their CT scans, MRI scans, and creating a computational model so that it behaves, the model behaves exactly how, like how the patient's liver is gonna behave in real time. Right, so this is, will allow us to plan the surgery in 3D and be able to predict how the patient's liver is gonna behave during the surgery itself. All right, so this goes beyond just planning on a 2D screen and generating a 3D image. This is planning in 3D in real time based on the patient's own biomechanical properties and how their liver is gonna behave and eventually you're gonna use it for other organs like the heart, the brain, the lungs as well. All right, and moving on from that, using a digital twin model we feel that it is not enough to just model organs, right? The aim is to model whole patients, whole environments. So that for example, in this case, right? If let's say we can do a 3D mapping in real time of full environments, in this case is the operating theater, we can potentially project an operating theater NUH right here on the stage. And that will create the immersive experience, not just for conferences, but for remote assistance, remote proctoring, remote teaching, you have an expert who is 10,000 miles away who can essentially be in your OR as a hologram and be fully immersed in your environment and a full situation awareness of what's happening around in your OT. Uh, so this is where we see the next step when it comes to MR technology is going to, actually going to lead us. Now, moving beyond MR alone, we thought, okay, how do we then integrate other technologies and other projects in a hospital into what we call this MRXR platform. So in NUHS, we have a cloud robotics program, and this um, essentially is our development of 5G autonomous robots that's gonna go around the hospital, it's gonna deliver things, it's gonna look at, for example, remote patient monitoring, vitals monitoring, and this is kind of how the robot looks like. We just took delivery of our first unit a few weeks ago. We are planning to essentially start the trials later on um, this year. But what we see is an opportunity for us to amalgamate and to integrate this robotics, 5G cloud robotics program together with our XR platform so that one, we can potentially control the robots using MR technology. And two, is that we can always maintain situation awareness of where the robots are, what the robots are doing. If let's say I'm in my control center in the operations room and I'm using my helmet and my, my headset or I'm walking around the hospital, I know whenever a problem arises or if let's say a robot detects certain problems or emergencies in the ward, it's gonna notify us immediately. Education and training was, to be honest, not the top priority when we started this program. But as we moved along on the clinical aspects of it, the educational training aspects came along naturally. So nowadays, we use it quite a bit to teach our residents, our surgical residents, when it comes to applied surgical anatomy, allowing them to see the scans in three dimension and to appreciate from the surgeon's eye how to do a certain procedure. procedure excuse me. During the pandemic, we actually use this for remote ward rounds. Right? So, during the lockdown period uh, of COVID, the medical students were not allowed to enter the hospitals, right? So they could only go to the campus or they could only stay at home and they were confined to Zoom and MS Teams. In order to maintain the same level of immersiveness as well as engagement between the clinical teams and the patients, what we did was that we got the rounding teams or the teams inside the hospitals and in the wards to wear the HoloLens 
and we live stream the feed to the students in the lecture hall and the tutorial room. Right, so the students can still hear what the professors are saying. They can still interact with the professors on the ground because it's a two-way communication. And it allowed the students to essentially still experience or to have some experience of clinical ward rounds, interacting with patients, even from the confines of the tutorial rooms. We use it during surgery as well, where we actually pair up a trainee with a senior surgeon. And because you know, these devices, you can use it as a sort of multiplayer kind of a setup, you can have the trainer go through the entire case with the trainee, show them exactly what they have to do, show them from their perspective what they need to see, how, what, they, how, what, what do they need to perform. And we find that this is a lot more immersive compared to, for example, drawing it on a piece of paper or just going through it on a computer screen. And of course, we've actually also started using this for patient counseling. Right? So instead of, so when patients come to us, especially for complex surgeries like transplant, instead of using generic pre-made models, instead of drawing on a piece of paper how the surgery is going to be, we show them their own holograms. We show them a generated model of their own scans, and we run through the entire surgery process together with the patient using MR technology. And we find that regardless of age, young, middle, old, um, the patients have a very, very deep appreciation, much more um, using MR technology than us explaining it on a piece of paper or just using generic models. So building on the education side, um, we have a sister program at the NUS School of Medicine where we use MR technologies to teach our undergraduates for both nursing as well as the medical school on certain skills, certain areas, for example, procedure skills, patient counseling, interactive anatomy. And this is kind of one of the sort of programs that we developed together with Microsoft to teach students how to you know, set IV plugs, um, how to take blood from patients, how to insert catheters for the patients. These are fully standalone software that students can actually use at their own time. They don't have to come for you know, prearranged sessions. This is what we, a concept, I guess, that we're moving towards which is what we call directed self-learning. Right? We give the students the independence to explore, but we provide them with the necessary equipment. The next question is then, with all this technology, all these requirements for compute, how do we actually scale? Right? Devices like the HoloLens 2 have a very, very limited compute power, beyond which it just doesn't work or it overheats. So for us, it's a natural step to go into edge computing, fault computing, cloud computing, to try and essentially lessen the burden on local compute on a local device so that we can do much more, much faster. Right? So in NUHS, we have our own AWS cloud, we have our own Azure cloud, and we use that quite a lot for both research as well as production level capabilities. And when, once we started doing that, we realized one very important problem, which is data transmission. Right, NUH has a pretty stable Wi-Fi network, which is based on Wi-Fi 5. But what we quickly realized is that because of the sheer amount of data that we transmit every single day, every single second, the Wi-Fi system was not capable enough and things does, do not work. Right, so this is when we decided to do our trials. Um, this is back in September 2021 on 5G technology. Right, so this is data. Numbers that you see here, this is actually taken from our operating theaters. You can find, you will see that 5G offers a much higher bandwidth and much lower latency compared to either Wi-Fi or 4G. Right? And this essentially was when we started our journey together with Singtel, Microsoft, IMDA, and we're very grateful to IMDA for awarding us a grant to deploy a private indoor 5G network within the hospital for us to do what we want to do. And with that, we have actually installed um, or retrofitted 10 of our operating theaters with its own indoor private 5G network. Um, the installation was actually just completed a month ago. And right now, we're in the process of retrofitting four of our inpatient wards with its own dedicated indoor private 5G network as well. This essentially was one of the important pieces for us to develop what we call an integrated platform and integrated network. So this network that you see in front of you, this is created by NUH, Singtel, IMD, and Microsoft, and Apple Clar. 
And what this allows us to do is to send identified patient information from our intranet, which is a secure environment, through what we call our healthcare commercial cloud layer and link it to the internet. This is a system that exists nowhere else in the world. This was um, fully customized because we saw the need for it. Right? Because right now, most systems only allow you to send anonymized data and not identified data. And with this system, we could finally have an integrated platform where we have instantaneous access to a patient's data, instantaneous access to a patient's scans, imaging, information, and this actually gives us a good foundation so that we can scale, we can expand, and we can just add on use cases. For now, we are using it mainly for image transfers and image retrievals. But beyond this, remote patient sensors, patient wearables, patients who are at home with remote sensors that's connected to our network, all this information will flow back to us and can be processed in real time, and we can act on it in real time. To put that into perspective and to show that this is not a sort of you know, pipe, pipe dream or a fantasy, I'm going to show you two videos here, right? The one on the left is our new 5G and edge compute, uh, computer integrated network. The one on the right was our Wi-Fi network. This test was just conducted earlier this week. I want you to notice the time it takes for the gray color hit to turn into a sort of reddish color rendering, and this is a real-time remote rendering. So I'm going to start with the 5G one first, right? So once they press the button, right, about one second. It takes about one second for it to do the remote rendering process and show you an image of what it looks like inside the patient, right? Now, moving on to the Wi-Fi one, the button is pressed. The button has already been pressed, right? Not only has the rendering not come out. It hasn't actually even started. Uh, this is in the exact same location in our operating theater, exact conditions. This is at 10.30 in the morning. Right? No point for us testing this in the middle of the night when there's no one else in the hospital. We wanted to test it in the middle of the day and when everyone is around to make sure that this system works. Right? And I've been talking for a while and the Wi-Fi one just came out. So this is essentially real-life demonstration of the benefits of a low, high bandwidth, low daily latency, integrated secure data network to form a platform and one step closer to a full ecosystem. There are, of course, a lot of challenges and hurdles that we'll need to cross um, in, in this journey. We are no um, strangers to a lot of problems. We had problems in our programs early on. We, we learned our, our lessons and we learned from our mistakes and now we have moved on. And right now, although XR, MR is still kind of like a novelty to most of us, but we feel that this represents the future of technology and capabilities in healthcare. And hopefully one day, you know, devices like the HoloLens 2, Magic Leap 2, XR, MR, AR technologies will no longer be a novelty. It will be a commonality that we see, something like how we use our smartphones today. And this is my last slide. This is a very famous quote. The best way to predict your future is to create it. And with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you.